Like all scientists tracking biological changes, George is witnessing visible changes in biospheres that have been stable for millennia. I didn't think I would be seeing the loss of a major ecosystem or, the, or seeing a species that uh, basically has depended on that system for the past 25,000 years have to deal with the loss of that system. Knowing that, and then also knowing that, that people know what the cause of that warming is and nothing much is being done, is very frustrating. Other creatures are being transformed by the changing environment, particularly those in the acidifying ocean. The more carbon dioxide that's taken up by the oceans, the lower the global climate change will take place. Originally, we thought this was a good situation. So 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide has been taken up by the oceans. We now understand that over time, that has caused a 30% increase in the acidity of the oceans. And we'll start this model now the first thing you begin to see is more changes in high latitudes because more CO2 goes into the water at high latitudes. See changes in the Arctic in the Antarctic region first, but now we're out to the present. And as you go out to the end of the century, we see that the entire Arctic Ocean and parts of the North Atlantic and the North Pacific are now corrosive from top to bottom. That means shells and skeletons would dissolve from top to bottom. The same thing is true for the Antarctic region here, all the way out to Australia and parts of uh, South America. But even in the tropical zone, there are conditions no longer favorable for corals to produce their shells or skeletons. This is what the shell normally looks like, completely clear. This is what happens when you put it into 1100 microatmosphere CO2 for 30 days. Look how dissolved the shell is. And some recent work has suggested that we're changing the chemistry of the oceans now such that we see a whole new chemistry every 40 years or so. A number of organisms now are very sensitive to these changes. The impacts on reproduction, for example, in corals, we see a slowdown in the rate of growth of corals. Corals are particularly important because they provide a habitat and perhaps 25% or more of the fish that live in the oceans spend some time of their life in a coral reef habitat. So we see that there are implications through the food chain. Some fish in the high CO2 world, for example, the clownfish, they actually move towards their predators in a high CO2 world, as opposed to avoiding their predators in a high CO2 world. And this, they do this because the CO2 has an impact on their neuroreceptors. And so the fear response they have is just the opposite of what it should be. And there are other organisms that do well in a high CO2 world. For example, there has been some studies that suggest that jellyfish do better in a high CO2 world. So you could see there'd be a whole shift in the ecosystem. This is all related to ocean acidification.
And what does that mean for humankind? In our planet, about one out of every seven people, on average, uh, rely on seafood for protein in their diet. So we are very dependent on seafood. およそ地球全体で 4,000 万あるいは 5,000 万ぐらいのです、ね、生き物がいるんではないかというふうに言われています。研究者の人が今まで調べたそういう生物種だけでもです、ね、生物種というのはわずか200万しかないんですね。でつまり私たちは全体のわずか 5% しかですねまだ知らないということなんです。一番問題なのはですね、この生き物がものすごい勢いで絶滅しているところなんです。実際たあの調べてみるとですね、例えば地球上の哺乳類のうちのですね、すでに4分の1がですね、絶滅が心配されています。で、今まで過去地球の歴史の中でですね、どの時点に比べてもですね、まあ最低でも1000倍、場合によってはですね、1万倍ぐらいのスピードでこの変化が起きているというふうに言われているんですね。Five times before, Spaceship Earth has witnessed major die offs. Our scientific navigators say global warming has begun the sixth extinction. Its speed now depends on how quickly the planet warms, and that partly depends on feedback loops that we cannot control. Permafrost is something that is frozen for at least two summers in a row. Permafrost can be many things. It can be behind me sediment that is frozen. It can be a lot of ice in the ground, and we call that ground ice. But it could also, it could also be rocks. In permafrost, there is actually a lot of organic carbon. Why is it important? Is that because when the permafrost is warming, a lot of that carbon is being released, and is being released to the ocean when we are next to the coast, or it's being released directly to the atmosphere. And the subsequent release of carbon is what we call the feedback effect or feedback loop. The way it works is that permafrost gets warmer. The layer that thaws in the summer gets deeper and deeper every year, and the carbon that was stored in the permafrost for tens of thousands of years gets released to the atmosphere. Then that carbon, as greenhouse gas, influences the climate also and it gets warmer. And、uh, if the climate gets warmer, then we get like more thawing of that active layer in the summer. And the more thawing we have, then the more carbon get activated. So this is what we call the feedback loop, because like one process influences the other, and that goes on until probably all the carbon that is there stored in the permafrost is used to be released in the atmosphere. Permafrost extends under all of the Arctic land masses, but it also extends out to sea. It's a kind of relic of the last ice age. If you have warm water, the water melts the seabed. The permafrost melts, and that releases methane because there's a lot of methane trapped under the subsea permafrost. And methane is a very, very powerful greenhouse gas. It's more than 20 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. So, if you release a lot of methane into the atmosphere, you're going to accelerate global warming, and that, that's what seems to be happening at the moment. Bottom of the lake is where organic matter, which is dead plant and animal remains, is being digested by microbes. In Russian, they say that the lake is eating the permafrost, and I really like that analogy because, in fact, it is. 
when they digest that organic matter, they produce carbon dioxide and methane. Methane does not like to stay in the water, and it comes out of solution and forms bubbles. But there is the methane coming out right there. That's a nice example. Okay, go ahead. Well, yes, warming events can be very harmful. Today, the world is just sort of starting to show signs of the conditions we saw at the end of the Permian. The end Permian mass extinction happened about 251 million years ago. It's probably killed around 95% of all species on Earth. And we start to think, well, how could a huge amount of um, volcanic activity cause a global mass extinction like this? And most of the interest focuses on not the lava itself, but the gases that come out with volcanism. I think the main culprit we think of is, is the carbon dioxide. It started to release methane. And so what we think happened at the end of the Permian is we get this sort of runaway greenhouse effect whereby um, we're getting these two gases, methane and carbon dioxide, warming up um, the planet. Before you know it, the world has just got so hot that it becomes extremely hard for life. And we see a sort of a mass dying of, of animals on land and in the sea, both at exactly at the same time. We're just starting to see the start of, uh, of that effect. We're just at the earliest stages. Any report from the late Permian would say, yeah, be, be wary, be careful. The world is, is starting to break down and losing its ability to cope with greenhouse gases. And the big unknown for us today is how fast things happen. Will this happen in 50 years or will it, be, will it happen in 5,000 years? And it's really hard to know.